Women Up Radio, designed to facilitate women's empowerment, improve your career, develop your talents, incorporate your passions, achieve fulfillment and success. Good evening and welcome to Women Up Radio. Today's guest is Mark Hirschberg. He's a CTO, tracker of criminals and terrorists on the dark web, which I think sounds really exciting, software language developer, speaker, author, MIT instructor and creator of their Career Success Accelerator program, and another thing which I think is amazing, a top-level ballroom dancer, because I'm a complete dance fanatic. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. So today um, we're going to discuss your book, um, but we're particularly going to discuss how to design and execute a career plan the needs, and also you're talking about the essential skills for success that people don't really ever learn anywhere. So the book for everyone who's obviously going to go and buy it immediately is The Career Toolkit. Oh, I can't speak straight. The Career Toolkit, The Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. So, Mark, what inspired you to write this? We created MIT's Career Success Accelerator program 20 some years ago because feedback we got from corporations were saying, these are the skills we want to see in the people we hire, leadership, negotiating, team building, communication, and many others, but we just can't find them. Not just in the students who were hiring from MIT, not just in college grads from anyone. They could not find these skills. And it's because colleges don't teach them. We wanted to change this, so we started that program, and I was fortunate to help create it, and I've been teaching there for the last 20 years. For years, I was encouraging MIT to put this content online to share it with other places. MIT, of course, pioneered online courseware. For various reasons, they haven't been able to. And so I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write up some notes for the class. The class itself, it's very hands-on interactive. It's not us lecturing at the students. So they don't take a lot of notes. I thought, let me write up some notes for the students and I can put it online. I can share it with other folks. So I began, I wrote up what I thought would be 20 pages of notes, but 20 (laughs) became 40, became 60. And once it passed a hundred, I realized these are not just a handful of notes. I think this is a book. So I turned into the book and the companion app with the goal of reaching more people than just those who happen to be at MIT. Yeah. So would you say that um, the age group is more younger student graduates or for the whole spectrum? It's the whole spectrum. Any point in your career, if you say, I wish I was better at networking, I wish I was better at negotiating, I wish I was better at communicating, then this book can help you. And certainly getting it early in your career gives you a longer runway to apply them. But we've had readers in their 40s, 50s, even 60s say, wow, I wish I had this book 20 years ago, but thankfully I at least have it today. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I know for people like me, because I'm completely disorganized and everything, and I just sort of go through a door when it opens and I don't really think about things. Obviously now at my age, I can see maybe if I'd been better organized and better planned, I could have done something in more depth. But do you think people really need a career plan and why, and what are the types of questions they need to ask themselves about this? Because me, you know, my brain just doesn't function that way. <laughs> Dora, I want to note, you, you use the analogy of you go through doors when they're opened. Yeah. The way we created the class and the way I created the book is I open these doors. Oh. A lot of people will say, I wish I was better at networking. Most yeah. people don't need to be convinced it's important, but they don't even know where to begin. Yeah. And so what I do in each of the chapters in my book is I open that door. I say, here is how to get started on that path. I don't claim that I have the last word on any of these topics, but I'm going to open that door. I'm going to start you down the path. And then it's up to you how far you want to go. Okay. Now to your question about career plans. Yeah. So consider this. Imagine the CEO comes to you and she says, we have a critical project for the next two years. This is going to make or break the company. So I want you to tackle it. What do you do? You say, okay, sounds good. 
I'm going to go off. I'm going to take it day by day and I'll see you in two years. And well, let's hope I succeed. We're just going to cross our fingers. Of course not. That's not an acceptable answer. You say, okay, two year project, very critical. Let's yeah. define the goal. Let's then create a project plan, maybe a timeline, a budget. Let's have milestones and checkpoints. Now we know two things. We know you're not going to follow this plan to the letter. We know you are going to adjust the plan as you go. That's normal. Yeah. And that's what trips people up in their career plan. If you think about your career plan, this is not two years. Yeah. This is 10, 20, 30. To yeah. do it without a plan, that's insanity. <laughs> but just like our project plan, this is where people get tripped up. They say, how am I going to know what I'm doing in five or 10 years? Yeah. Well, how do you know what you're doing on day 631 of the project? You don't. But you have some placeholders where you think you'll be working around that time and you adjust as you go. So when we create career plans, we start with that goal and then we map out in the near term. It's very clear what you're doing the next three months, six, 12 months. What's happening a little further out is going to be fuzzier and we're going to regularly check in and adjust as we go. And by the way, if you change your career plan, we've all had projects at work where halfway through our boss comes in and says, hold up change of plans, new direction. You can do that with your career as well. It's your career. It's not yeah. set in stone. Now, having a plan doesn't guarantee success, yeah. but not having a plan is pretty much a recipe for failure. <laughs> right. So, and so when we start thinking about it, um, what types of questions do we need to ask ourselves? You know, just to do the, the basic layout of the first few steps. There's a number of questions. These are not only in chapter one of the book. I have them on the resources page of my website that we'll give yep. a little later. And these are questions. There's the obvious ones about our jobs. How many hours do I want to work? Yep. What's the nature of the work I want to do? Do I want to manage people or be an yep. individual contributor? But then there are also questions. In fact, arguably the more important ones about our life. Yes. From where do I want to live? What are my family plans? What type of yeah. impact do I want to have on my community, on the industry, on society as a whole? Yeah. And we need to think about these questions, even though they are not directly about our job or career, because our career needs to fit into our life instead of trying to build a life around our career. Yeah. And so that's why you want to start with these big picture questions and answer them, not just for today, but where you think you'll be five, 10, what's the impact you want to have yeah. in 15, 20 years? We want to plan ahead. So yep. start with these questions and add your own. Yeah. Yeah. That, that brings me on to thinking about leadership, but do you think people should regularly revisit their career plan? Is it something they should do often and do they need to change much, particularly if we want to become a leader? Yes, you need to regularly revisit your career plan. Yeah. Again, think of that project plan. You don't have a two-year plan and say, well, we wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just stick in the closet and go yeah. forward. You need to check back. Yeah. What I recommend doing, and I would even say pause this podcast at this moment, come back to it, but pause at the moment, <laughs> put a calendar invite yeah. for yourself in your calendar right now and say, think about career plan and have that recurring every six months. Commit oh, right. 30 minutes every six months to your career. That is a pretty small commitment, yeah. but it's going to really help you focus. If you can do an hour, even yeah. better. Yeah. But do that commitment right now. So pause and create that reminder. So every six months you do that check-in, you might even want to sync it up to be with a quarterly review, annual or semi-annual review. Yeah. So it, it's in coordination with how your company's thinking about your career. Yeah. Now you also asked about leadership. Yep. And do we need to plan to be a leader? And I think so. Leadership and really all these skills, these are learnable skills. People get tripped up because we see people who are natural leaders, natural networkers, natural communicators. Well, there are also natural golfers, people who are naturally good at math. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we can't get better at golf or math yep. or leadership yep. if we put in the time. And in fact, what we know is the people who actually regularly commit and practice and enhance their skills overtake the ones who say, well, I'm, I'm good. I don't really have to work at. Yeah. They tend to just stay at that plateau. Those of us who commit to learning and developing do better. So if leadership is part of your plan, and it should be, even as an individual contributor, 
you need to commit to developing your leadership. Yeah, that's interesting. And particularly because I frequently have fights with people about what leadership, well, fights. Um, I have discussions with people about what leadership really is and what it means and what it represents. So how can we define the difference between leadership and management? And when we are climbing the ladder, how can we adapt from one to the other? Yeah, great question. And let me talk a little philosophically at first, and then we'll get into some details. The best description I heard that distinguishes the two comes from Admiral Grace Hopper. And she said, no one ever manages men into battle. That doesn't define it, but if you think about it, you start to get a sense of what leadership is and how it differs from yeah. management. Yeah. Now, that said, there's another famous military, military quote, an army marches on its stomach. It's yeah. great to say, you know, inspire the troops and say over the top and charge and get everyone to do it. But if you didn't get your army to where it needed to be, if you didn't get the food and the fuel and all the logistics right, doesn't yeah. matter how inspired they are, they can't act. Yeah. At the end of my section on leadership and manage, I have three chapters on these two topics. I end by noting good leaders manage, good managers lead. For the most part, we will be doing the two simultaneously. Now I separate them because I really like looking at the fundamentals and understanding each piece, but no one says, okay, I'm gonna lead for five minutes, Okay, done with the leading. Now we're going to switch into management. Let me manage for a couple minutes. We just naturally flow back and forth yeah. between the two. The other key thing is that both of these skills apply even to individual contributors. Yeah. We think of it positionally. We think of when I have this title, director, VP, manager, then I am in charge of other people. I can order you work on this project. And we yeah. think that's leadership or management. Leadership true leadership is influential leadership and we yeah. can do it even when we don't have authority over someone yeah. management even when you're working with a team of coworkers, and we're all peers so i can't command you by say well how about this why don't we break this up and you're going to work on this piece i'll work on that piece she's going to work on the other and let's sync up let's uh wednesday afternoon we'll all sync up and we'll see where we stand that's a bit of management even though i'm not in charge of you so these are skills all of us need to develop early in our careers and they're going to serve us as we continue up the ladder. Yeah, ha, that's good. And that definitely follows much more with what I think, because I don't think leadership is just wrapping out orders. It's really inspiring people. It's giving them the real interest and the enthusiasm to go on and do something. But anyway, so do you think leading is different for men and women? This is we get on to the slightly more sensitive topic. <laughs> yes, it, it unfortunately is. I wish it wasn't, but that's what it seems to be. And my understanding of this comes from Deborah Tannen, who is a linguist at Georgetown. She has a great book called Talking Nine to Five. Mm -hmm. And she talks about the double bind that women face in leadership. Yeah. We have certain views of leadership. A leader should be commanding, decisive, unemotional. And yet, when we think that's, that's a very traditional view, I'm not saying all of us have this view today. If you want to understand it, look at yeah. a movie from the 1950s and look at oh, the God. leading man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now, when we think of a woman, what are the qualities society wants to see in a woman? You want to see emotional and supportive, yeah. soft-spoken, so this creates a challenge, and this is what Deborah calls the double bind, is that the more a woman meets the definition of a leader, the more she violates the norm of being a woman yep. and vice versa. And yep. so women are in this difficult state. And we've seen that. We certainly see it here in the U.S. with female leaders from CEOs to politicians who get criticized yep. for behaviors that we would not criticize in men. Yep. There is no silver bullet to this. I wish I could say, here's the magic phrase and it all goes away. It doesn't. Yeah. What we need to do is raise the awareness of this in men and women, because women also can judge other women this way. Yeah. If we are more aware of this, 
then when we see a behavior, if I see a woman do something, I think, ah, oh, that's, I don't know, it rubs me the wrong way. I can check myself and say, wait a second, let me imagine if Brad did that. Yeah. If a man did that, would I respond the same way? Yeah. It's not a perfect solution, but it's a good first step. Yeah, that's a really good idea, actually. And nobody thinks of that. They just do their instinctive reaction and they don't try and be more objective and, and disassociate from that. So do you think there ladies are different- who are listening, uh, ladies who are listening, share this podcast with your male colleagues. Now yeah. tell them, oh, there's great career advice and other things, but they're going to hear yeah. what we just spoke about. Yeah. They're going to hear this and think, oh, but she just said good career advice. But I guess I picked up this tip as well. Yep. <laughs> Excellent idea. <laughs> so um, do you think there are different advantages for men and women in the corporate world? I think there can be Mm -hmm. based on how we tend to engage, partially how we're perceived as leaders. And here, I think men do tend to have that edge because they don't violate the norm the way, unfortunately, our perspective on women do. But even how we engage and socialize, men tend to be more competitive. And again, I'm, I'm drawing on Deborah's research and other research I've read. We are all about one-upping. I yeah. think about, as a kid, the game we used to play, King of the Hill, where the boy tries to stand at the top of the hill and the other boys run up and try to knock him off and then someone else is on top and someone else knocks him off. That is a very male game. Yeah. And that's representative of how we think. We are in competition with our peers, with our friends. We're always competing. Women take more of a collaborative approach. Women, to use a game analogy, would not want to be on the top of the hill. They'd want to be holding hands together at the same level. Yep. This is not true for, for everyone everywhere, of course. Yep. I'm generalizing, but it's a much more collaborative approach trying to create us as peers and equals. And that can be advantageous in certain situations as yep. well. So we have to recognize these styles generally, but more importantly, our own implementation of this style, because again, not all men and all women behave a certain way, and then recognize where that can be an advantage or disadvantage circumstantially. Yeah. And use that in our career to get our career going in a suitable direction. So I know obviously we're we're talking mostly to women now, um, and my podcast is about women, women's careers. So we have to take into consideration family because women normally are more responsible. I don't agree with it, but it's still the reality. So in your book, with all of the advice you give and all of the tools, is there a way that women should think about incorporating their family into a career plan, but still achieving their career objectives? I mean, how can we do that? There are two things to really think about. Mm -hmm. First is that at some point, and as you know, unfortunately, women do tend to bear more of the burden of childcare and home rearing. Yeah. And so recognize when are you thinking of having a kid Mm -hmm. or kids? What is that impact going to be on your ability to work? And can you set yourself up in certain roles where it's more it's more conducive to the lifestyle you want at that time. If, for example, you look at your career and you say, well, at some point I need to get more international experience. So I'm going to have to run a division on a different continent. And at some point I'm going to have to focus more operationally, maybe on the manufacturing that we do in the company. Well, let's think about when you're having those kids, because the operations piece you can do by driving to the factory, that's, 20 miles away. But when you're running that international group, obviously you're going to be traveling a lot. And so can you think through your plan as you map out five, 10, 15 years in the future where you can put certain pieces? Can you arrange them to coordinate with your family plans? Now, one other thing I'll note, there can be an advantage. Children are wonderful for networking. When you have kids, excuse me, when you have kids, you're going to take them to other events with other parents at your school, at your religious community, at 
tots who are tumbling or whatever they're calling the, the kids programs these days is a great chance to meet other people and extend yeah. your network. So they're not all a limitation. They can be an advantage if you see how to use it. Well, that's a good idea. I never thought of that. But yeah, particularly with the pandemic and we've seen so many people online and kids coming racing in when you've got this incredibly important CEO who normally is very commanding and suddenly you've got the child is oh darling yes okay you really do see the other side so yeah that's excellent and um, another thing which is possibly a slightly delicate subject again because I like delicate subjects does HR have a place in achieving all of this or is it better to design and execute our plan ourselves? And I'm asking this because I work with a lot of countries um, and there's a very different image of HR, what it does, its responsibility, depending on the country um, and also depending on the size of the company, obviously. But in some countries, HR is really God. Um, and even the CEO sort of lets the HR take priority. And I have to admit, and I think a HR can do a fantastic job, but I have to admit sometimes I feel it's not ideal. <laughs> so what do you think about that? Do they really have a place in helping us achieve it? Or should we stay more independent or What's your view? The answer is yes. I know that wasn't a <laughs> yes, no question. Yes, HR should. I yep. believe every manager and HR as a proxy for the manager has a responsibility to the people we manage, the people we employ to help them grow, to help them in their careers. And HR is a resource for that. This is even more important now as we look at the great resignation Yep. We are seeing a rewrite of the contract between capital and labor. It is no longer simply about, are you paying me enough? Where yep. pay could be bonus or equity or other compensation. It is about other ways people can grow and benefit, including workplace yep. culture, alignment to mission, and their growth. And so if companies want to stay competitive, they very much need to help people develop. Yep. To do so, it begins with the conversation, the conversation I have with everyone the day they join my company. When I hire someone, I sit down and orient them. I ask them, tell me about your career plans. Tell me about where you want to go in this company and even beyond. Yeah. Because if I understand where she wants to go, then I can help get her there. But I can't yes. do that if she doesn't talk to me about it. Yep. So we have to have these conversations. And I think we even need to be honest about the fact that, you know what? I'm not going to be working here in 10 years, yeah. but probably neither are you. And yes. that's okay. We can be honest in the long term. I don't want to say like, hey, help me find a new job. That's yeah. not HR's job to find you something outside the company. Yeah. Although I've done that for my employees. I will yes. do that. Uh, yeah. I think it's a manager's job, maybe not HR's. But even if you don't want to go that far, we can be honest and say, well, here's where we can take you the next four or five years. And we recognize that might be as far as you go in this company. Yep. And that's okay. And we'll keep that in mind and we'll help you and be supportive. Yeah. Now I say they should in reality, <laughs> I have seen many that don't, yep. they don't believe this is their responsibility. They certainly are not comfortable with the types of conversations that we just talked about. And ultimately you need to take ownership. Yep. It's not unlike when you're raising children, the school should be educating them. The school should be helping them as well as other resources you have, but you are responsible for your kids. You can't say, well, not my fault. The teachers did a bad job. Nope. These are your kids. The buck stops with you. So this is your career. You have to take ownership. You have to drive it. If you've got HR or your manager or other people can come help you along, fantastic. But if they can't, the responsibility is still on you. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because I know, um, Sometimes I've found that people really want something, really dream of doing something, but they don't get the support, they don't get the opportunities, and they get almost pushed in a different direction because it's more suitable for the company. And that's where I find it's a very 
difficult balance to try and navigate almost through, you know, the, the murky waters. You're not quite sure, really, should I do that? Or is it just they want me to do that because it's better for the company? Or, and it's difficult, it's a difficult position. That's literally one of the examples I use when I open the book because I've seen this happen. Yeah. Your manager, HR, the company, they have certain goals yeah. and you can help them achieve it, which may or may not align to your goals. Yes. Now, all of us at some point, hey, we need you to work on this project. It's not fun. You're not going to like yeah. it. But I just, I need you on it for the next three months. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's part of life. Yes. But if they're putting you down a path for the next two or three years, yeah ask if this path is taking you where you want to go. Yes. I personally have left companies. I do a lot of startup companies yep. and we pivot often early on yep. with big changes. Sometimes when we pivot, I say, you know what? I, the company, it's been great. I like the people, but where we're going as a company, that's no longer the direction I want to go in. Yeah. And it's time for me to leave. Yeah. So own your career and try to try to be in the same lane with your company if you can, but at a certain point where someone needs to make a left turn, <laughs> don't just say, well, I guess I have to go with the flow. No, go in the direction you want to go. Excellent. Thank you very much. So that has been really, really helpful and very interesting. And I'm going to do the six month, half hour for myself as well, because I think that's brilliant advice. Do you have any other final piece of wisdom or key strategy that you think we should keep in mind helping us going forward? Here's the important piece, because I see your cat just woke up. I know, up my cat. Paying exactly. attention <laughs> to this important piece of information. These skills are learned very differently than how we have usually been taught. If you think back to high school, to college, to your corporate training, they say, oh, we have a new payroll system, and here's how you file your monthly expense report. So, okay, I just have to memorize this. When you use that knowledge, well, when it's time to turn your report, you say, I know how to fill it out. I know how to put the form online. When you learn quadratic equations in school, when do you use it? Well, if you ever see a quadratic equation, you say, ah, okay, apply the formula. It's very black and white. It's very much regurgitation of knowledge. Yeah. That is not how these skills work. There is no formula for leadership. There are no three things to do to always communicate. It is subtle. It is context specific. Yeah. And it's the type of thing that we need to continue to explore and learn because it's multifaceted. I would like it more to learning a sport. That's not something we don't say, okay, you've, you've learned cricket. You joined our team. We sent you to a two-day cricket training facility. And now you're back. You're on the team. Done. No more training for you. You learned everything in those two days, right? Yeah. Done. That's not what we do. We say, you have to keep learning. You have to keep practicing. And so we need to continue, continually develop these skills. And much like learning a sport, there might be some drills you can do on your own, but it's scrimmage and it's practice that you do with others. So the best way to learn these skills is to do it through a peer learning group. And I have a resource on my website. Yep. completely free for how you can set up your organization, your department, your division, your company to create these peer learning groups so you can learn together. It is absolutely free to download. It is free to use. There's no cost using a system unless you want to buy your own content. For content, sure, you can use books. You can use my book. You can use other books. Yep. You can also use great podcasts like this one or articles or videos that are completely free but it's consuming the content and having discussions around it. Yep. That's where you really start to explore the subtleties. And that's why doing it repeatedly helps keep it top of mind and yes. enhances your ability. That is how we need to learn all of these skills. Yeah, that was excellent. Because interaction and creation and it gives the, the energy, the enthusiasm. Excellent. That's lovely. So, Mark, where can people get in touch with you and where can they find your book? My book is available from Amazon and many other major bookstores and even a few minor ones. Yep. You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com, and there you can learn more about the book, including where to buy it. You can touch with me or follow me on social media. You can download the free companion app from the Android and iPhone stores, but it's linked from the website. 
Yeah. And there's the resources page I've mentioned, which has the download for how to create the peer learning groups, as well as the questions we mentioned earlier, and a whole bunch of other great resources, all of this at thecareertoolkitbook.com. Brilliant. That's great. I'll put all of the, the links that you have on the bottom of the web page anyway. Um, but as you said earlier, anyone who's just running and listening to the podcast, now you know where you can find it all. Mark, thank you so much. It's been really incredibly interesting and really helpful. And I think particularly for women to be able to get the different vision and to see that you really can get to the top and you can have a family and you can take all of that and adapt it to you. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me and good luck to everyone with your careers. Lovely. Everybody, we'll see you again next week. And hopefully we're going to have Mark back on the show on Beyond the Bottom Line, talking about the holistic way of managing your career. So don't miss our next show with Mark. Take care and see you soon.